Um, good morning, everybody. Um, despite that very kind um, opening by the chairman and acknowledgement, I just want to make it clear that actually what I am is a barrister and I am not all knowing in regard to the law. So what I tell you is just simply my view of what the law is in this area. But I'm open to suggestions by anybody else. Uh, when I got roped into this, uh, somebody came to me and said, could you write a paper in three pages that explains the constitution and the position of the family and the position of marriage under the family? So what I said to them was, that's the equivalent of saying, can I explain nuclear fusion in three pages and give a coherent account? Um, obviously, one has to try to just get the, the major points and the major emphasis here. And all I can hope to do in the 10 minutes I'm going to speak to you this morning is to give you some idea of the basic feel for this and the parameters within which we are working here. We're dealing with a very important uh, part of the Constitution, Articles 41 and 42, which deals with fundamental rights. And a, an essential part and a very important part of Articles 41 and 42 is the institution of the family. Our Constitution places great emphasis on the family and it makes clear that very important protections are available to the family which would not be available to other institutions um, who do not have the characteristics of the family. And it is clear from the Constitution that when you're talking about a family, you're talking about a family based on marriage. Um, the courts have accepted that a married couple with children constitute a family, and equally they've accepted that a married couple without children are a family for the purposes of the Constitution. The family is recognised as the fundamental unit group of society and the state acknowledges its important role and because of that gives it very significant protections. Those protections and, and the rights which come with the protections are such that they cannot be taken or given away, in the words of the Constitution, inalienable and imprescriptible. Uh, the Constitution also recognises the right and duty of parents to educate and to rear their children. And just to make clear, the Constitution doesn't define who a parent is. Because of the very significant protections of the family, the state can only interfere with the family in limited circumstances and in exceptional circumstances. And a presumption arises under the Constitution that the welfare of a child is to be found within his or her family. What does the Constitution say about marriage? Well, firstly, it tells us that because the family is based on marriage, protection is given to marriage. Now, there's a very large amount of case law in the courts that deals and give some indication of the nature of marriage. And I have kind of summarized it in this way. It says that the Constitution indicates that uh, marriage is derived from the Christian notion of partnership. And indeed, there are a number of cases which seem to indicate that it is confined to persons of the opposite sex. Um, one of the cases refers to a monogamous union of a man and woman. And, and there's been a number of cases in the last year or two dealing with the situation of polygamous marriages abroad and whether they are entitled to recognition under Irish law. Polygamous marriages being marriages where you have a number of wives, for, for example, in the Islamic tradition. Um, and the, the bal balance of that case law is, no, we don't recognize those types of marriages. Um, under the Constitution, the state is obliged to guard with special care the institution of marriage on which the family is founded and to protect it against attack. 
As a result of this constitutional guarantee, the state cannot, by its laws or by its actions, treat people in a less favourable way because they are married. Also, the constitution permits the state to treat people in a more favourable way because they are married. Is there a constitutional right to marry? The answer to that is yes, there is, and it has been recognised by the courts. But that right can be regulated in accordance with the common good. That regulation takes place by law, by the laws passed by the Oireachtas. And w there is a law that deals with this, the Civil Registration Act 2004, and in certain circumstances, marriages are prohibited between certain people. One of the classic examples is the prohibited degrees, where people are so closely related to each other, they're not allowed to marry. But one of the circumstances under that act where people are not allowed to marry is where they are of the same sex. And my understanding is that legislative provision is the subject of a constitutional challenge which has not been yet disposed of by the courts. What is the proposed change or what are we discussing? In broad terms, what is proposed is that the Constitution should contain an express acceptance of the right of persons of the same sex to marry each other. I want to be clear about this. There would be certain effects that follow on from this. The effect of this that, would, that such a marriage between people of the same sex would be entitled to protection under the Constitution, as would the family founded on that marriage. So when you're talking about change here, you're not just talking about change about who can marry, you're talking about change who is a family, and you're talking about change of the nature of the families who are protected. A number of significant questions arises, and I have just outlined them at the end of my paper. For example, just take three short examples, and I finish up with this. Should we have the same rules in regard to same-sex marriage if we're going down that route in regard to marriages that take place abroad, same-sex marriages, as would take place in Ireland? A second very important point is, is the, if the Constitution is to be changed, should it just allow the legislature, the Oireachtas, to make laws providing for same-sex marriage? Because if it says the Oireachtas may do that, that would be a matter at the discretion of the Oireachtas, and it might do it tomorrow, or it mightn't do it for 10 years, or it mightn't do it for 20 years, or it mightn't do it at all. On the other hand, if the Constitution says that the, Oireachta, or that the state shall provide for same-sex marriage, well then, that must be done, and it must be done reasonably quickly. Finally, I just want to end with the issue of children because you'll be hearing a lot about the situation of children. I think one has to face up to the fact that if you allow same-sex marriage, there are going to be changes, and in particular there are going to be legislative changes required in regard to the treatment of children. Now, I have no doubt, and who is considered to be a parent under Irish law? There is no doubt, I think, that is going to be the case. And I think some of our discussion today will probably centre on the nature of that change and what would be involved. I, I finish where I started. Um, all I can do is give you a flavour of this. All I can do um, is put my toe into the water and invite you all to jump in because it's all very nice and warm and interesting. Thank you very much. Jerry, thank you very much. I think that's about as clear as you could get uh, as an introduction. Um, I'm now delighted to ask uh, Sarah Fennell uh, to, to present. Um, Sarah is a practicing barrister with specialization in family and child law. She has appeared as junior counsel before the High Court, Supreme Court, and the European Court of Justice in several key family law cases. And she lectures in family law in the diploma course at the Honourable Society of King's Inns and in European Union Law at Griffith College in Dublin. Sarah. Good morning, everyone. 
May I begin firstly by thanking Tom and Art and the rest of the team for inviting me to address the Constitutional Convention this morning. The purpose of my paper, which will be brief, is to consider whether an amendment to existing constitutional provisions on marriage and the family may require the introduction of legislative changes. In the event of constitutional amendment to protect same-sex marriages, it would appear that the area of children's rights is one that will need to be considered. With the introduction of the Civil Partnership and Certain Rights and Obligations of Cohabitants Act 2010, the legal rights of spouses and civil partners are in many respects similar. A particular area where there is a remaining difference in respect of the treatment of spouses and civil partners is in regard to the children of those relationships. May I just make it clear at the outset that this paper is merely to provide an overview of some of the areas that may require legislative change. It doesn't purport to set out a definitive overview of every legislative change that may arise, and equally, it doesn't set out to propose model legislative answers, as I, I don't believe that's the function or why I'm called to speak here today. In terms of the areas that are particularly relevant in respect of children's rights, you'll see from the paper that I've identified a number of core areas. They are adoption, parentage, guardianship, custody, access, inheritance. I now have nine minutes left to speak. This is necessarily going to be a brief run through. I can't follow the entire structure of the paper. I'm going to give you a general flavour and the rest of the points are fleshed out within the paper itself. Beginning with adoption law, the legal framework for adoption law presently in Ireland is the Adoption Act of 2010. In particular, Section 33.1 of that Act addresses the categories of persons who may be eligible and suitable to adopt a child. Presently, same-gender same couples are not included within the categories eligible and suitable to apply to adopt a child. Should one partner in a same-sex relationship apply to adopt a child, that applicant must satisfy the adoption authority that that is desirable in the particular circumstances. The restriction on adoption in the context of same-sex relationships also applies to inter-country adoptions, with the effect that should a foreign jurisdiction permit same-sex adoption, the state here in Ireland will not recognise that inter-country adoption in those circumstances. So clearly, should a constitutional amendment carry through in terms of same-sex marriage, it will require questions to be addressed by the legislature in respect of whether same-sex couples are permitted to adopt and also whether there should be any distinction in treatment between intra- and inter-community, uh, I should say inter-country adoptions. I'm going to move on quickly now to the issue of parentage. If I may begin by saying that the area of assisted reproductive technologies is largely unregulated in Irish law, the absence of regulation was commented on by the Supreme Court in the Orr and Orr case concerning the protection of frozen embryos in 2009. Since the Orr and Orr case, there have been other domestic cases in this area, including sperm donation and most recently a High Court surrogacy case. There is provision in Irish law pursuant to Section 35.1 of the Status of Children Act 1987 for a child to obtain a declaration of parentage. The test for that centres on ascertaining inheritable characteristic, and that test is operated through a blood test. And most recently, the law in respect of parentage has been the subject, as I've previously mentioned, of a High Court surrogacy action in the context of motherhood and gestational surrogacy. And the High Court found in the last couple of weeks that the genetic mother was the person with the necessary inheritable characteristics and accordingly the mother at law. Previously, a number of years ago, in MacDNL in 2009, the footnote for that is in your paper, the Supreme Court held that the unmarried father as a sperm donor had the right to apply 
to be appointed a guardian of that child pursuant to the Guardianship of Infants Act 1964. We know the answers to those cases, but the reality is that parentage can arise in a whole host of different circumstances. For example, it may be that the commissioning parents themselves provided the egg and sperm, as was the case recently in the High Court surrogacy case. You may have a situation where the eggs are provided by a surrogate. You may have a situation where the eggs and or sperm are provided by another third party. And these present scenarios for the legislature to consider in the context of parentage, should a constitutional amendment go through. I should also say that I'm not suggesting that assisted reproduction is limited to the area of same-sex relationships, but the physical reality is that procreation within a same-sex relationship will always necessarily require the intervention or the assistance of at least one third party. The Civil Partnership Act that I've previously referred to of 2010 didn't address the legal relationship between a child and non-biological parent. So should this constitutional amendment go through, it will require the legislature to address the area of parentage in respect of establishing parental status within a same-sex marriage. I'll move briefly on to the area of guardianship. This is governed by the Guardianship of Infants Act 1964. Very briefly, the concept of guardianship generally relates to rights and obligations that a guardian has in respect of the child. By way of example, it concerns fundamental decisions affecting the child's upbringing and welfare. For example, where does the child live? In what religion is the child raised? They are the types of areas that fall under the umbrella term of guardianship. Very briefly, under existing Irish law, married parents are the joint guardians of a child. An unmarried natural mother of the child is automatically the child's guardian. An unmarried father, if he does not subsequently marry the mother, is not automatically the child's guardian, but may apply to be made a guardian by a number of different mechanisms, such as court appointment, agreement with the mother, or on the death of the mother or other guardian. And the father is permitted through biological connection with the child to make those various applications or to invoke those different mechanisms that I've just set out. Where a person doesn't have a biological connection with the child, for example, where a same-sex couple is parenting a child, but one partner is not biologically connected to that child, there is no current provision in the Guardianship of Infants Act 1964 for an application by that non-biological parent to legal guardianship. And that position wasn't affected by the Civil Partnership Act of 2010. There is provision in the Guardianship of Infants Act, and you'll see this towards the end of page four of the paper, pursuant to section seven of that act, to appoint a testamentary guardian by will, by either of the guardians on their respective deaths. And that would have the effect that a same-sex partner could be appointed a testamentary guardian of a deceased partner's biological or adopted child. However, this only works in the event that there is agreement between the existing guardians and the testamentary guardian who is appointed. If there is a lack of agreement, an application has to be brought to court to resolve that. Therefore, again, in the event of a constitutional amendment to permit same-sex marriage, it will inevitably require the legislature to consider the position of one of the parents of that child who may have no biological connection with the child but may be caring for that child on an ongoing basis with the biological parent. Linked to guardianship is the custody concept. Custody and guardianship are often confused, but whereas guardianship is a form of global decision-making affecting the child in terms of long-term decisions, custody is more to do with the day-to-day -day care and control of the child. Now, much of the legislation on guardianship is mirrored in the custody legislation. So, for example, married parents are the custodians of the child. An unmarried mother is automatically the child's custodian. The unmarried father, even if he's not a guardian, may apply to be a custodian. I haven't specifically referred to all of the sections in those regards, but they all come from the 1964 Act as well. 
And similarly to guardianship, you could have a situation where a person carrying out a parenting role in respect of the child has no biological connection in respect of that child. And once again, that is a matter that the legislature would have to consider in the event of an amendment to permit same-sex marriage. Moving on to access, again, we're still in the territory of the Guardianship of Infants Act 1964. This is on page six of the paper. I just want to specifically refer you to one section of that act in this regard, section 11B of the act. That allows for access applications to be brought in respect of a child by an extended member of the family. Now, this provision could include a partner of the child's biological parent who was in loco parentis to the child. However, the way the Section 11B application works is by means of a two-stage process, which is different to the situation if, for example, the unmarried father brought an application. When I say a two-stage process, it basically means that you have to apply for leave of the court before the substantive application can be heard. And the court will take account of a number of factors as to whether it should move on to hear the substantive application, including any risk of disruption to the child's life or perhaps the wishes of the child if that was appropriate in the particular circumstances. A question will arise in the event of an amendment going through as to whether Section 11B should remain in its present form or whether the two-stage process needs to be amended. Nearly there. Moving on to financial issues for a moment. Maintenance. This is governed by a different piece of legislation than the legislation I've referred you to so far. This is principally governed by the Family Law Maintenance of Spouses and Children Act 1976. And again, you'll see reference in it to, in, in, in your paper. That 1976 Act, as it's presently formulated, does not limit the definition of a dependent child to a child of both spouses. In other words, the meaning of a biological child within the meaning of the current definition, includes a situation where one parent, the other spouse that is, may not be the biological parent, but may have acted in such a way towards that child that he or she effectively treated the child as a member of the family. And in those circumstances, that could give rise to maintenance obligations. There is no corresponding definition of a dependent child in the same context of same-sex relationships. So once again, in the event of an amendment for same-sex marriage, the legislature may have to consider the financial implications in terms of maintenance obligations by the non-biological parent towards the child of that union. Second last area I'm going to look at is tax, and this will be very brief, because whatever legal explanations I'm competent to offer in the other areas of the paper, I'm by no means a tax lawyer. So you'll see that by reference to three lines on tax law, where I, I just refer you to the Finance Number no. 3 Act of 2011, which essentially bridged the gaps between married partners and civil partners. And from there on in, I would refer you to the Revenue Help Desk in terms of in terms of any other provisions related to tax. Last area is inheritance. This is principally governed by the Succession Act of 1965. You'll see particular sections referred to within the paper. They relate principally to distribution among the issue, i.e. the children, and whether children are permitted in some circumstances to bring an apl application to court if they consider that a parent failed in their moral duty to make provision in the context of succession. The area, this area of law wasn't amended by the Civil Partnership Act 2010, and so once again, in the event of constitutional amendment, the legislature may be required to consider the area of inheritance law in terms of obligations by a non-biological parent to the child of that union. That's as brief an overview as I can give. It, it, it literally highlights some of the areas that the legislature may have to consider. It doesn't propose solutions, it's simply a way of providing for some discussion today for the members of the convention. I hope you enjoy the rest of the weekend and thanks for your time. Again, thank you very much, Sarah. Uh, when we were thinking about what needed to be presented to the convention, we clearly understood that we would have to put before you some of the legal 
co and legislative consequences in the event of a constitutional change. And I think Sarah has, has dealt with a very complex issue in as, ma in a, in as, as, as clear a way as, as was possible. I'd now like to, uh, another dimension is the experience in, in other countries. And for this, I want to invite Emer Brown. Emer uh, to present. Emer is academic coordinator of the Diploma in Legal Studies at the uh, Society of King's Inns, where she also teaches human rights law and the introduction to the legal system. She's an adjunct uh, lecturer in Trinity College, Dublin, where she teaches introduction to law and aspects of Irish law in a European perspective. She's practiced as a barrister since 2004, practicing mainly in family law and employment law, and she's currently on leave of absence from the bar in order to focus on uh, teaching and research. Her main research interests in focus on human rights law, particularly the European Convention on Human Rights and its interaction with the Irish law. Prese uh, producing this paper took a considerable amount of work, all done over the Easter holiday, and then when she finished that, she went off and ran the Connemara Marathon. Uh, so this is, an, uh, this is a, a competent and a very competent person, Emer. <laughs> uh, morning, everyone. Um, I presume the round of applause was for the Connemara Marathon as opposed to, <laughs> to anything else. Um, listen, it, it's an honour to be asked to speak to you this morning. Um, it's an honour and it's also a little bit terrifying, uh, but um, it, it's great to be here. So what I'm going to talk to you about briefly is... Um, a little bit of information on same-sex marriage in other countries. So give you a bit of a, a comparative example of how this issue is dealt with in other jurisdictions. Um, now, I should say to you, the paper is very much a summary of this area, and um, what I'm going to give you is a summary of the summary, uh, because we're quite strict on time, etc. And to that end, I'm actually going to start my stopwatch, um, so I don't get in trouble. Um, okay, so... Main aims of this paper, first of all, to give you an overview of some of the approaches to the formalization of same-sex relationships in other countries. And um, then secondly, uh, to deal with situations uh, where legal recognition of those relationships is permitted, what happens uh, as regards any children um, of those same-sex families. So again, very much a summary, not exhaustive, but I'll do my best to give you um, some of the key pieces of information. So just so you know, there are really four main approaches to this question globally that I've been able to come across. Um, so I'm just going to describe those approaches to you. Obviously, it's not my function to, to recommend any one of them or uh, take a view. There are four main approaches. Uh, the first approach is to allow same-sex couples to marry under basically the same conditions as opposite-sex couples. So that's option number one. Option number two um, is where you don't allow same-sex couples to marry, but you do allow alternative registration of their relationships, so alternative formal uh, legal represent, uh, recognition. So, for example, a civil partnership arrangement, uh, as we have under the current legislation, would be an example of example number two. Um, number three, uh, much less common in Europe, but it does exist uh, globally, is a prohibition on marriage between persons of the same sex. So that's the third option, actively prohibiting it. Um, and the fourth option uh, is failure to address the question entirely. There are some states that have yet to address their minds to this issue or have yet to uh, legislate or, or uh, consider this matter. So those really are, are, are the four main approaches. I'm going to try and mention an example or two of each of them uh, to you. Um, there's more detail in the paper, um, so if you, if you want to have a look at that and if you have any further questions, obviously, uh, you can ask me. Um, so... What we'll do, I suppose, is just quick, quickly give you a little general uh, picture of the law in this area. So just so you know, there is still, on this matter, diversity of approach at both global level and European level. In other words, um, it's not like the whole world is doing one specific thing. There is a diversity still. However, um, it's probably fair to say that there's a discernible trend, notably within Europe, uh, towards uh, legal rec recognition of same-sex relationships. Now, that's not universal, but it is particularly widespread in Western Europe to recognise those relationships in some uh, legal fashion. Um, within that trend, within the, the countries that allow legal recognition of same-sex relationships, um, there's a, a further trend towards allowing um, marriage on more or less the same basis or on the same basis as opposite-sex couples. Now, that's a, a smaller trend within that trend. Um, that's a more recent trend, 
Again, it's not universal, but it is there. Um, now, as Sarah has pointed out, a key issue um, in, in this area is the issue of children. Um, and in that area, um, I suppose there are various ways in which a children, a ch children might be affected by uh, same-sex relationships. Um, I suppose if you think about them logically, you might be a child born to one parent in a same-sex relationship. You might be a child adopted by one parent in a same-sex relationship. Um, alternatively, you might be adopted by both jointly in countries where that is allowed, and it's allowed um, in several countries. Um, or you might be a child born via assisted reproduction. Um, so that Sarah has touched on that in, in her paper. Um, assisted reproduction might be something like um, a child uh, born via sperm donation or born via surrogate. Now, um, I suppose on that point, uh, many of the countries or some of the countries that allow uh, same-sex marriage don't necessarily permit surrogacy. So if you like, it, it's a separate point. Uh, it's a separate legal point. Um, and surrogacy arrangements where they are allowed are frequently availed of by opposite sex couples. So I suppose try to maybe keep them uh, separate in, in your head um, as two separate issues. Um, so as far as children are concerned in terms of general trends, there is a general trend um, towards allowing one same-sex partner or opposite sex partner uh, to acquire some measure of parental responsibility um, as regards the children of their partner. So for example... Um, you've got a family where one person is the biological parent of a child, um, perhaps their first relationship breaks up, they now have a new partner. The new partner, in many countries, regardless of gender, can acquire parental responsibility in respect of the stepchild, if you want to call them that. It's probably the easiest way to think of them. Um, and um, that really involves uh, the step-parent acquiring sort of guardianship rights. Sarah's explained that concept to you, but parental responsibility... Um, in many of these countries would be a bit like guardianship. You'd have decision-making capacity, etc., in respect to the child. Um, now, across Europe, there, there are some divergences on that issue, uh, but uh, in several countries, it is possible to acquire parental responsibility. Furthermore, um, there's the issue of uh, adoption by same-sex couples. Now, uh, I think more or less, the vast majority of countries allow uh, people to uh, adopt regardless of their sexuality on an individual basis. Increasingly, uh, countries are allowing same-sex couples to adopt jointly also. So that's another uh, increasing trend out there. Now, again, there is no, con there's no uh, absolute consensus there, but there is an increasing trend in that direction. As regards assisted reproduction, that is a very divergent area. So some countries, for example, ban surrogacy arrangements altogether, some countries ban surrogacy arrangements if money changes hands. Some countries ban surrogacy arrangements uh, for same-sex couples, but not for opposite-sex couples. So that's a, just a, a minefield of an area uh, where the approaches are very, very different. Uh, funnily enough, um, conception via sperm donation seems to be kind of uh, popular uh, and not and, and less controversial. That just seems to be the way, the way it is. Okay. So what I'm going to do is take you through a couple of examples of each of the, the models, the four models I described to you. So the first one uh, being marriage, uh, where countries where same-sex marriage um, is allowed. Now, um, in this area, you may have heard a bit about the US recently. There are cases going through the US Supreme Court on this point. Uh, the United States is federal, so each of the federal states um, may have a different approach or have different approaches uh, to this question of same-sex marriage. Some allow it, some have civil partnership. Uh, type legislation, some don't allow it at all. Um, and uh, the US Supreme Court is currently deciding whether or not a federal law that refuses to recognize same-sex marriage is constitutional or not, but we don't have that answer yet. Um, so from within Europe, uh, the two examples I put in your paper are the Netherlands and Spain. They're not the only examples, they're just uh, two examples uh, out of the available ones. Um, I chose them really because they're quite culturally uh, different countries. They're They've got divergent histories, uh, divergent religious traditions, etc. Uh, but they both allow this full marriage model. So in both of those countries, same-sex couples can get married under the same uh, law as uh, opposite-sex couples. Um, and flowing from that, uh, same-sex couples tend to have uh, quite extensive rights as regards uh, children of that relationship. So for example, um, it's possible 
for one member of a same-sex couple to get parental responsibility of the child of another, be it a biological child or an adopted child of their partner. Um, in uh, both countries, it's generally speaking possible for um, same-sex couples to adopt jointly, etc. Um, there is some divergence, again, on the surrogacy issue, uh, but in both countries, um, there is access to, uh, for example, uh, sperm donation and, and conception in, in that way. Um, the next example, then, is the example of registered partnership arrangements. Now, these are not the same as marriage, and there are different types of these throughout Europe. Uh, in some countries, you can allow registered partnership arrangements to um, opposite sex and same-sex couples. So in some countries, um, you can have this registered partnership or civil partnership, regardless of whether you're um, in a heterosexual couple, couple or a same-sex couple. They don't care in some countries. Um, the way these partnerships operate depends very much on the country that you're in. So in some countries, a uh, registered partnership will be a sort of a separate but equal arrangement. And by that I mean it won't be the same as marriage legally or formally, but it will uh, give you most of the same uh, rights and duties, etc., as marriage. It will be formed in the same way, more or less dissolved in the same way. Um, in other countries, um, it's a sort of separate but unequal arrangement where um, it's separate from marriage and very legally different. So, for example, in France, they have a thing called the Pax. Um, in uh, Pax, uh, uh, anyone can sign up to it regardless of gender. So it could be an opposite-sex couple or a, a same-sex couple. It's very much based on a kind of a contract between the parties, and it's very different from marriage. Uh, under Pax, you don't automatically inherit uh, from your deceased partner, for, for example, unless they have put you in the will. So um, that's a, a very different arrangement from marriage. It's really more dependent on uh, the attitude of the members to the partnership. Now, that contrasts with uh, the UK. The UK's regime of civil partnership is really very similar uh, to marriage under the law of the UK. And it gives almost really all of the same rights. Uh, the main difference is that it's called something different. It's called a civil partnership instead of being called a marriage. Uh, but the people who are uh, civil partners in the UK have a large number, to a large extent, um, the same rights as somebody who is a, partner to a party to a marriage in the UK. Um, so, for example, um, as regards children, a civil partner would be in a very, very strong position in the UK as regards things like parental responsibility, um, second parent adoption, where a step parent adopts the child of their partner um, and they become an equal uh, legal parent. Um, and there is also extensive, extensive access to assisted reproduction in the UK. Now, that's because they give extensive access to assisted reproduction, including surrogacy, to everyone. So uh, that's, that's really there for everybody there. Um, there are proposed legislative uh, amendments in both uh, France and the UK at the moment. Uh, if those amendments are passed, that would make uh, marriage, civil marriage, uh, open to same-sex couples in both of those jurisdictions. So you've probably seen um, that on the news. Uh, I understand the Senate passed uh, the uh, French uh, bill yesterday. So um, those are, are, are kind of ongoing proposed amendments. They're, they're not in force yet. Um, in the UK, uh, it would make, I think, probably a minimal difference because their civil partnership regime is so robust, whereas in France it will make a massive difference if they, if they pass that law. Okay, we're nearly there. A uh, couple, uh, couple more examples. Uh, there are some countries where same-sex marriage is banned. Um, again, uh, there are bans on same-sex marriage across the world. But for example, um, several African countries have explicit bans, um, such as Nigeria and Uganda. Um, I believe they also uh, have uh, certain criminal penalties um, uh, for uh, people engaged in same-sex relationships also. Um, now, Hungary... Um, is uh, slightly different. Hungary has a civil partnership arrangement at the moment, um, but it's been reported that they want to enshrine in their constitution a statement saying that marriage itself is only for opposite-sex couples. So the, the formal uh, legal institution of marriage is only for opposite-sex couples. Having said that, the Hungarian constitutional court's position is certainly that in terms of de facto relationships or common law marriages, you know, where people really are living together and acting like they're married, in those cases, um, the Constitutional Court of Hungary has said you can't distinguish between same-sex and opposite-sex relationships. Um, there are also a couple of countries where um, they haven't done their homework as yet. 
Um, so, for example, there, there are areas of uh, the former Eastern Bloc where they haven't really addressed this question. Um, in Greece and Italy, they've yet to address this question, let to, yet to um, institute any uh, particular model to deal with uh, formalisation or otherwise of same-sex marriages. Um, so I suppose the conclusion from uh, my research is, is really that there's no one model for dealing with this, but um, there is a trend towards legal recognition of same-sex marriages, and within that, one might discern a smaller, a more modern, more recent trend um, towards uh, allowing same-sex marriage on the same basis as um, opposite-sex marriage. Okay, I hope that wasn't too confusing or too fast. Uh, thank you for listening. Yeah, I want to thank all three presenta pre presenters, uh, not just...